I don't have any jokes. <laughs> I, I do play blues harmonica, but I didn't bring a harmonica, so. <clears throat> That's a great introduction, thank you. It has been 50 years, I thought about this just the other day, 50 years since I started as a graduate student studying psychotomimetics, psychosis producing drugs, which we now know as psychedelics, which the police still recognize as hallucinogens. But uh, psychedelics is the term I like. So this is going to be a general overview. It's going to be review for many of you. Can you hear me this? A little closer? Yeah. It, I'm going to give a sort of overview of the field. Some of this will be a review for many of you who are sort of dilettantes and aficionados. For others, it may be new material. But just to give you a background, some of the things we know, how we got to where we are today, which is really amazing. I can tell you that uh, I was involved, in, along with Matt Johnson, in founding the International Society for Research on Psychedelics. We're having our first inaugural meeting in New Orleans in October. We have over 100 attendees all scientists, and very few of them came from overseas, so there's probably another 50 there. So there are approximately 150 people in the world, scientists today, researching psychedelics. In 1969, you could count them on one hand. Sasha Shulgin, me, and three other nameless people. So this is an old cartoon from a Playboy that was sent to me by a psychiatrist probably 30 years ago. That was the perception of psychedelics. They give you bizarre visual things. That's all anybody thought about them. But the actual definition, this is a legitimate definition that was in Goodman and Gilman's Pharmacological Basis of Therapeutics, which is the pharmacologist Bible, so to speak, written by uh, Jerome Jaffe. The feature that distinguishes psychedelic agents from other classes of drugs is their capacity reliably to induce or compel states of altered perception, thought, and feeling that are not or cannot be experienced otherwise except in dreams or at times of religious exaltation. You won't find a definition of any drug class like that anywhere else. Dreams, religious exaltation, and this is consistent with the history and it's what we know about them today. So this is a legitimate scientific definition. You can quote it in a scientific paper. So let me talk briefly about some natural sources. We all know about mushrooms, various species of psilocybe found worldwide. We know quite a bit about them. The principal active components in there are psilocybin and a little bit of psilocin. Psilocybin, where this R group is attached, is a phosphate group. It's very stable. Samples of psilocybin made by Sandoz are stable for 50 years and still good, but in the body, what happens is there's an enzyme that cleaves off the phosphate to reveal an OH there, and psilocin is the actual active species, or as Albert Hoffman would have pronounced it, psilocin. We first learned of these in 1957 when a banker, an amateur mycologist named R. Gordon Wasson, traveled to South America and had an experience with a shaman there. We knew in South America there were all these mushroom effigy stones, which represented something. We weren't sure what until the mushrooms were actually discovered. This is Maria Sabina. She was the uh, curandera that R. Gordon Wasson has, had his experience with. And so his experience was written up in Life magazine, these mushrooms that cause strange visions. <coughs> now, how, how long ago did we know about mushrooms? We're not really sure. But we know that in the ancient Indian literature, in the Rig Vedas, there were hymns written in worship of a substance called soma. We don't know what soma was, but in 2009, there was this textile weaving that was excavated in a tomb in southern China, next to India. And in this weaving, there's obviously a mushroom here. This is a priest. This is some sort of religious ceremony. And this, according to the authors, looks like psilocybe cubensis. Now, he wasn't holding this mushroom out as a dietary supplement. This was a religious ceremony, and it's a Zoroastrian ceremony. So it goes back to the time that Soma probably existed. We drank Soma, we became immortal, we came to the light, we found gods. That sounds like a mushroom experience to me. 
And then in ancient Greece, for 2,000 years, there was a ceremony in the village of Eleusis, 15 miles outside of Athens. And every year, any adult who had not been convicted of murder was privileged to attend that all-night ceremony. It was held in a building called the Telestrion. And there were attendants, there were candles, there was chanting. And they drank a brew called kaikion, which is dispensed out of this container in the middle. These were little offerings of grain and so forth in the outside, but it was dipped out of the brew in the middle. We don't know what that was. Um, we know that it had mint and barley, so that's led to speculation that maybe there was some ergot derivative in there. But I think it was probably a, a red herring, because in fact, if we look at this depiction, a scene from the Eleusinian Mysteries, Persephone taking a mushroom from Demeter in the fourth century. Again, this mushroom was probably not a dietary supplement. So based on what we know about this ceremony, it was a very powerful ceremony. We don't know very much because if you spoke about the ceremony, they killed you on pain of death. So we don't know much about it. And it was profaned in about 400 AD when some, some Greek rabble found the ceremony for it and started having weekend parties with Kaikion. But again, the idea of the mushroom, and this was a 2,000 year ceremony. Think about how long that is. Every, Greek, every great Greek you could ever think of probably participated in this Eleusinian ceremony. So what else do we know? Well, natural sources of DMT. Probably a lot of you are aware of Mimosa hostilis. You can extract DMT out of that. DMT is a very fast-acting, short-acting, very powerful psychedelic. And ayahuasca, you all are aware of what ayahuasca is. It's a brew. These are Banisteriopsis capifans, and they have compounds in them called beta-carbolines. And beta-carbolines block an enzyme called monoamine oxidase in the liver. So Psychotria gritis, Jacruna, they have DMT in the leaves. But DMT is not active orally. If you eat DMT or ingest it orally, it's broken down in the liver by monoamine oxidase. Well, Banisteria scopi has monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So if you beat these vines up like this and boil them with psychotria leaves, boil them for a long time, it extracts out the DMT and the beta carbolines, and now you have a brew called ayahuasca, which is essentially an orally active form of DMT. And then we have 5-MeO-DMT, which you've heard referred to comically. This is the drug that'll blast you into the outer universe very quickly and lasts for about five or six or seven minutes. It's used, it's also in the Varola snuff. They take the bark of this tree and scrape out the red inner bark and they make a snuff. If you ever saw the movie years ago called The Emerald Forest, you saw Indians using this. One Indian blows it up into another Indian's nose and the Indian who gets it blown in his nose just collapses in a fit of ecstasy. This is extremely powerful, in my opinion, one of the most powerful psychedelics that's out there. With DMT, if you take DMT, you sort of know you're still there while you're watching the fractals and things. But with 5-MeO, you're just free-running consciousness. You're not, there's no awareness of who you are. You're just following the experience along. Extremely powerful, but very short-acting. People who smoke 5-methoxy-DMT often talk about being in, going into the light. <clears throat> um, peyote is a, a substance that's used by the Native American church. They have protection under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to use peyote in their ceremonies. If you possess it and you're not a member of the Native American church, it's illegal. And it has a simple phenethylamine called mescaline. It's a 3, 4, 5, trimethoxy phenyl ethylamine. Sasha Shogun and I made many hundreds of analogs of mescaline because it's the simplest compounds to synthesize. So there's a lot known about mescaline. All of these compounds work in the same way. They activate a type of brain receptor known as the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor. Now, I'm not going to go into chemistry because I doubt there are many chemists here. But we've done a lot of work, and based on our studies, we think that phenethylamines bind to the receptor in a shape like this. So the side chain is twisted out of plane of this benzene ring. So it's out of plane, it's perpendicular, and that's the way it binds to the receptor. And the reason we did that is because people had suggested for years 
that because mescaline and LSD work the same way, that mescaline must adopt a shape that looked like LSD. And I didn't believe that, and we proved that wasn't true because this looks nothing like LSD. And you'll just have to take my word for it. <clears throat> so what about LSD and ergolines? So ergot is a very old substance that's been known certainly since the Middle Ages and before. It's a fungus that infects rye grains. So wheat, barley, and this is the ergot fungus. This is called the sclerotia. And it's a sort of hibernating form of the fungus. And <clears throat> in years gone by, this contaminated grain, and I'll mention this, and caused some serious health problems. But this is ergot, it's the sclerotia. And if you actually plant these things, and give them favorable conditions, they'll sprout and form actually little fruiting bodies, um, mushrooms. What these have in them are lysergamines. So this four ring system is called an ergoline system, named for the fact that it came from ergots. And these substituents up here are usually very complex molecules, cyclic peptides, things like that, ergotamine, ergonovine, there's a whole host of these alkaloids that are produced by ergot, and they're very toxic. So here's claviceps purpurea on rye. Again, these are the sclerotia. Claviceps on tall fescue. And here are claviceps that have been put into conditions that cause them to sprout. So you can see it is a fungus. It becomes active. It's hibernating here in the sclerotia. And now, if it's, if it's given conditions, it forms these fruiting bodies. So it is a fungus. You can see that it looks like any other fungus. There are lots of grasses, Claviceps paspali on Dallas grass. There are a lot of grasses that sheep and cows will ingest and get sick, get the staggers, and have serious health problems because of ergot growing on these grasses in a symbiotic relationship. Now, in the Middle Ages, we had scourges of ergotism. More than 40,000 people died from an epidemic of ergotism during the Middle Ages. And the problem is, ergot derivatives cause constriction of the fine blood vessels in your fingers and toes. Profound constriction. And so if you bought bread that somebody had made that had a significant contamination of ergot in it, you could get vasoconstriction, constriction of the blood vessels in your fingers and toes. And that would last so long that your fingers and toes would literally die. They would become necrotic, turn black, and fall off if you lived. Here's an example of what gangrene looks like in the fingers and toes. And it could produce sores all over the body in this old Hieronymus Bosch painting. So it's a very, they're very toxic molecules and have a long history. In addition, we have ergot derivatives that occur associated with the seeds of what the Aztecs known as Ololuiki, which is a type of morning glory, Turbina corimbosa, also occurs in Hawaiian baby wood rose. These also are, li are lysergic acid derivatives, but they simply have an NH2. Instead of a big complex peptide attached up here, they have an NH2. This is called lysergamide, or ergine. And you could go out and buy morning glory seeds and grind them up, extract them, and take them. You won't find it very rewarding. It'll probably make you feel pretty sick. But supposedly, the Aztecs used this when they couldn't get access to the mushrooms, which they called tail nonacotyl. Now, this is LSD. So you see all we've done is taken the ergoline nucleus. Without this piece up here, if this was a carboxylic acid, this would be called lysergic acid. This is lysergic acid, diethyl amide. So these ETs are ethyl groups. They're two carbon ethyl groups. This is LSD, profoundly potent. Discovered, this effect's discovered in 1943. Now, if you had a child in 1943 that developed schizophrenia, psychiatry at that, in that era was dominated by psychoanalytic theory. They had no awareness of neurochemistry. They had no drugs for treating mental illness. So if your child had schizophrenia, it was your fault. You were a bad mother. We had something called refrigerator mothers who had not nurtured their children. So mental illness in that era was blamed on the parents. 
Imagine how devastating that would be if you were a parent. Your daughter develops, or son develops schizophrenia. Psychiatrist says, you really screwed up everything you tried. It's your fault. A lifetime of guilt, right? So, <clears throat> no knowledge of brain chemistry at all. But then, in 1953, 10 years later, serotonin was discovered in the brain. Now, in your body, most of the serotonin occurs in the intestines, we call it enterochromaffin cells. And it's responsible for gut motility. A lot of the side effects of SSRIs are related to effects on serotonin systems in the gut. And there was a woman named Betty Twarog who was using an assay with an edible uh, muscle, a quahog. And there's a muscle in this quahog that is exquisitely sensitive to the effects of serotonin. So if you take this muscle out of the, the muscle out of the muscle and hang it up in an organ bath and bathe it in artificial cerebral spinal fluid, and then you squirt in serotonin, it contracts and it pulls these threads. And if you put in more serotonin, it'll pull even harder. So you can measure that with a, what's called a force displacement transducer, and it'll show you how much pull that muscle is producing in response to serotonin. So she was working at the Cleveland Clinic, and she wanted to study serotonin in different tissues. She, she came there and used that assay and analyzed tissues from a variety of tissues from all kinds of animals and uh, looked at whether they had serotonin. So she wanted to look in the brain. And the guy who was her mentor running the clinic said, there's no serotonin in the brain. You're wasting your time. But she did it anyway. She took cow brain. She found that there was such serotonin there. Well, now you see what I've highlighted here. This is the structure of a tryptamine. Serotonin is a tryptamine. It's a 5-hydroxy tryptamine. But you don't have to be a chemist to see the structure relationship there. So by then, Sandoz had been sending LSD out by 1950, 1952. All the psychiatrists knew about LSD, what it was. It produced this model psychosis. It was extremely potent. A tenth of a milligram could produce these powerful psychoactive effects. And now serotonin was in the brain. So immediately, within a year, you started seeing literature appear talking about serotonin in the brain. All the literature prior to 1953 talked about serotonin in blood platelets, serotonin being involved in blood clotting in the intestines, and then suddenly they found it in the brain. So now you start seeing papers appear, and if you go look in the scientific literature, you see almost an exponential increase in publications relating to serotonin in the brain. What's it doing there? So now we had, within a year, hypotheses in 1954 that maybe serotonin was responsible for the mental effects of LSD. The LSD was blocking serotonin, and later that LSD was parroting or mimicking serotonin. That all began with the discovery of LSD and the recognition of this tryptamine fragment within the structure of LSD. So when, in the 40s, we thought of people being bad parents, suddenly <coughs> psychiatry and neuroscience became aware that maybe neurochemistry has something to do with behavior. And that seems really silly for us to think that way now, but that was an aha moment. And that really led to all the drugs used for treating things related to serotonin. Anti-migraine drugs, SSRIs, all that serotonin neuroscience research really was catalyzed by the discovery of LSD and its powerful effects. So how do these drugs work? Mescaline and related compounds activate these two receptors, serotonin 2A and 2C receptors. Tryptamines, DMT, silas, and psilocybin activate these two receptors and in addition activate the serotonin 1A receptor. And LSD activates the same two receptors, the 1A receptor, and a whole host of others. So LSD is either promiscuous or has rich pharmacology, depending on your perspective. <laughs> We don't know too much about the role of 5-HT1A. 5-methoxy-DMT powerfully activates 5-HT1A receptors, but the phenethylamines don't. LSD is a powerful activator of 1A receptors. So it may be important in some way, maybe affecting the qualitative aspect, but basically the trigger that turns things on is a serotonin 2A receptor. We've used the antagonists that block these receptors and block these receptors, and things that block the 2C receptor have no effect on the psychopharmacology. 
So we're pretty sure that 2A receptors are the target. And all the research now is focused on that. There's some research looking at some of these other receptors that LSD interacts with, but LSD does a lot of kind of different things than simple compounds. <clears throat> so what is a serotonin 2A receptor? So it, it's a member of the G protein coupled receptor family, or GPCR. GPCRs are transmembrane proteins. So here's an example, and you can imagine that the membrane, the nerve membrane, would be approximately between here and here. They're embedded in the membrane, and there's seven helical segments. So it's a long protein, and it threads back and forth through the membrane and forms a bundle of seven alpha helices, what are called alpha helices. Anybody here who's taken biochemistry knows what an alpha helix is. And it's threaded back and forth through the membrane. And in the inside of the membrane, it couples to GTP binding proteins. And there's a G alpha, G beta, and G gamma subunit. They're coupled to the inside of the receptor. Now, if you see pictures of these receptors, often they show them as great big things, and these are very little. The inside, these G proteins, are really the business end of the molecule. So what happens when LSD binds, if this is the serotonin 2 a receptor, it fits down inside that helical bundle, and the receptor changes its shape and adapts to the molecule that's in there. And in the process of doing that, there are loops in the bottom that change their shape. So remember, this goes in and out and in and out and out through seven helices, and you have these connecting loops on the inside of the receptor, from the bottom of helix 1 to the bottom of helix 2, the bottom of helix 3, the bottom of helix 4, etc. So the, those loops inside change the shape they have, and that alters their coupling with the G alpha subunit, and it dissociates. There's an uh, exchange of DDP and GTP. I'm not going to go into the kinetics of all this. It dissociates, and then it dissociates from these two, which stick together, and that produces the signal inside the cell. So the psychedelic activates the receptor by binding inside the outside of the receptor changes its shape, that leads to changes in the interior of the receptor, which then dissociate from these other G proteins. And they go on and turn on other signaling molecules within the cell. So that's the basic mechanism. And this is an inactive and an active form, and these are just shown in the alpha helices. So this shows that you have, at the bottom of the receptor, it's pink is when it's activated. So it binds up inside here, and that leads to changes down here. The bottom of the receptor typically moves out from the receptor, and the top part moves in. So there's a dynamic process that goes on. So where is that receptor? Must be important. So here's a graduate student that failed out of our program at Purdue. We sliced his brain up, and we, <laughs> we incubated it in ra with radioactive heat cancer, which is a ligand that binds selectively to serotonin 2A receptors. And the colors relate to the density. So low density of receptors to high density. And what you can see in the outer layers is this high density of binding. That's where the receptors are located. And it turns out they're expressed, heavily expressed, on the apical dendrites of cortical pyramidal cells. And I'll explain that. So here's a micrograph of a section of this cortex. This is the cortical pyramidal cell here. And you see this dark here, darkness here, and darkness here. That's the part of the uh, dendrite on the cell that goes into the cell body. So they're expressed on the apical dendrites of these pyramidal cells, so-called pyramidal cells, because they're shaped like little pyramids. And these are probably the most important cells in your brain. They're in the cortex, all throughout the cortex. And they're responsible for high-level functioning executive functions, decisions, all the processing that occurs, occurs in the cortex, primarily by these pyramidal cells. They're like, almost like the central processing unit in a computer. They take all the information that's coming from subcortical structures, and they somehow integrate it and produce something that we perceive as reality. <coughs> and here's what the cortex looks like, stain, and it has six layers. So the outside of the cortex, farthest point out is L1, and then we have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And these are the cortical parameter cells down here in layer 5, between layer 5 and 6. You can see they're larger, and they have all this, the blue is a, a 
inhibitory and the red is act is uh, excitatory is red. So they're getting all this input and it's being processed in the cortical cells and then they send information farther on down. So 5-HT2A receptors are located throughout the cortex on probably the most important single receptor type in the cortex. And so it's no surprise that when we start changing the electronic properties of those cells that our perception has changed. Now, <clears throat> although I had lots of graduate students who volunteered to take the compounds I made, <laughs> it's not something I was able to do. So how do we study them? How do we know that these compounds were actually active? So in physiology, pharmacology, if you want to know what something does, you take a drug that activates the receptor and you give it to the animal. So if you want to see what beta adrenergic blocking agent does, you give it to an animal and you find out it slows down its heart rate. Well, if you want to study consciousness, then you should use drugs that affect consciousness. So there was one paradigm that you probably are all aware of, and we couldn't use this. This is Sasha. <laughs> Sasha Shogun, bless his heart. Um, and of course, he tested them. And he gave them to his wife to see if she liked them. And if they both liked them, they had a group of people that would go out and to somebody's house on the weekend, and they would take them, and he would write uh, notes about it. Those notes are in the book he published with his wife called Pikal. Phenethyl means I have known and loved. If it, is there anybody in here that doesn't have a copy of Pikal or has never seen Pikal? Yeah, like half a dozen people. And then he wrote about tryptamines and Tikal. Yeah, I like to move. A lapel mic would have been great, but I'll try to, to contain my enthusiasm. Sorry. I get excited when I talk about psychedelics. So how did we test them? And I'm going to tell you the assay we used. It may seem a little strange, but it worked very well. We use something called two-lever drug discrimination. And this is a cutaway box. We've cut out the front and side here. And it has two levers in here. We have a house light, and we have a pellet delivery system. This pellet delivery system delivers 50 milligram sucrose pellets. Sucrose is sugar. And so they're rat candies, 50 milligram rat candies. And so <clears throat> we train rats to press a lever. Now in the wild, rats don't press a lever. So we teach the rat to press a lever. And then after the rat learns to press a lever in a box with just one lever, we put him in a box with two levers, and we turn one on and we leave one off. So let's suppose we want to train this rat to recognize the effect of LSD. So we put him in the box on day one, and we give him an injection of LSD, and we activate the right lever. So we turn on the right lever, he goes sniffing around. He knows about the levers because he learned to press a single lever. So he starts going back and forth trying to figure out what's going on. He presses the right lever and he gets a rat candy. Presses the ref left lever, nothing happens. So he goes back and forth and he finds out, well, if I press the right lever, I get a food pellet. If I press the left lever, nothing happens. Then we put him in on the second day. And now we give him a saline or placebo injection and we turn on the left lever. Now he goes in, he goes back and forth, he presses each of the levers, and now he finds out that if he presses the left lever, he gets a, a, a rat pellet. If he presses the right lever, nothing happens. Then on the third day, we switch back and say, give him, turn on the right lever, give him LSD. So over a period of two to three months, we can shape his behavior so that he learns, and we did use male rats, sorry, my apologies to the women. We only use male rats. And over two to three months, the rat reliably learns that if I get LSD, I press the right lever. If I get saline, I press the left lever. And that's a very robust response. If we put the rat in there for 15 minutes, he will press the lever for 2,000 times. In fact, that turned out to be a problem because like all scientific equipment, these food pellets were not inexpensive. <laughs> so the rat would go in and just go, like, go batshit on the lever. <laughs> So we made it difficult. We made the rat have to press 50 times before he got one pellet. So they still press like crazy. They just have to wait every 50 times until they get a bunch of food pellets. 
Now, the beauty of this assay is something called the two-state hypothesis. If we, give that, if we train that rat with LSD, and we now give him amphetamine, or MDMA, or any other psychoactive drug, he'll press the left lever. He only presses the drug-associated lever if we give him a drug like LSD. And we train rats with amphetamine, MDMA, uh, fenfluramine, all kinds of psychoactive drugs. If it's psychoactive in humans, you can train a rat, or morphine, you can train a rat to respond to it. But they'll only respond to the training drug lever if you give them the training drug or a drug that they perceive to be like the training drug. So what we did then is make analogs, mescaline analogs, LSD analogs, uh, whatever. And now we give them to these trained rats. And if it's a rat that's been trained to recognize the interoceptive or internal cue that LSD produces, and we give him an LSD analog and he presses that lever, what he basically is saying is, I think you gave me LSD. <clears throat> Now, that's a pale reflection of what happens in humans, obviously, but it allowed, allowed us to take quantitative measurements. So we had colonies of anywhere from 12 to 15 rats that were trained, and we would take each rat and give them increasing doses on different days so we could generate a dose-response curve that would give us a relative potency compared with, say, LSD, the training drug. And in retrospect, we went back, and in my earlier 2004 review, we compared the potency and drug discrimination with human potency and there's a nice parallel. Question. Um, I was just wondering what you meant by animal. Um, uh, LSD and MDMA, that's the same thing. I, I can't hear you exactly. What was your question? Um, you mentioned animal. You were saying like analogs. Analogs. Analogs are derivatives of LSD. Okay. So not LSD per se, but we would change parts of the molecule. And I'll show you an example of that. Okay. Same thing for mescaline or tryptamines. <laughs> So we train them on a standard drug, and then we see whether they discriminate that we gave them a drug like that drug. And there's one other assay. We haven't used this, but it was developed by Adam Halberstadt, which is a mouse head twitch, which seems kind of bizarre. Give a mouse a psychedelic, and he shakes his head. 90 hertz, 90 times a second. That's pretty fast. And you get, a, you get a little burst like that. Now, normally in this assay, what you would do is take a video camera and you have a graduate student or technician watch these mice and try to count how many times they shook their head. <laughs> but what Adam did was very clever. He opened the scalp and he cemented a neo, neo, neodymium magnet to the skull, closed them back up, so now they have this powerful magnet on their head. And then he put them into a glass tube that had a wire coil around it. So what happens when a magnetic field oscillates in a coil? Anybody in here had physics? Generates a current. So now, vehicle, this is DOI, a psychedelic phenethylamine. No DOI, 0.25 milligrams per kilogram, 0.5 and one. So you get a regular increase in the number of head twitches with increasing dose. So here was LSD in an assay, and you can see in time and with different doses. The advantage of this is there's no training. We had to train our rats for two to three months before we could use them. And then they were very valuable rats. We would keep them for a year or two until they eventually died. Mice don't have to be trained to do this assay. And when I started using rats, they cost about $2. When I quit using rats, they were about $50. But mice are cheaper, and they don't have to be trained. So this is a very fast assay, and this activity generally correlates with human psychedelic activity. Again, this seems crazy, but when you can't give it to graduate students, uh, you're limited in your, limited in your options, so to speak. <clears throat> so I'm just going to show you one of the kinds of studies that we did. So you may not know it. L this is LSD, and these are ethyl groups. They're two carbon ethyl groups, so this is LSD. And if you change the diethyl group on LSD, even slightly, you attenuate its potency, usually by at least an order of magnitude. And that was always curious to me as a medicinal chemist, because that's unusual. When you do chemistry on a molecule, usually if you change pieces of it, you'll see some decrease in activity, maybe an increase in activity. But it's usually a fairly regular process, and you can see a general attenuation as you make more and more changes. But LSD, 
change that diethyl group, and boy, it just isn't active. The molecule doesn't have activity anymore. So we wondered why that was. So we hypothesized that maybe there was a specific spot in the receptor where that diethyl group bound. So we made some analogs. So if you don't know chemistry, I'll just have to explain this. But this is a, a butyl group, one, two, three, four carbon atoms. And this has a stereochemical center here, which we've designated as R. And this is a butyl group here, but this stereochemical center is S. It's the mirror image. And so using rat drug discrimination, here is the ED50, 28 nanomoles per kilogram of body weight for rat. So that's a pretty potent compound. This one is almost as potent as LSD, 33 nanomoles per kilogram. See the numbers, 28 versus 33. But when we reverse the stereochemistry here, it drops off to 124. So clearly, whatever, wherever that part of the receptor, whatever the part of the drug is binding in the receptor, there's some preference for the R stereochemistry over the S. <clears throat> and if you hook the two ends together of this ethyl and make this five-membered ring, which is called a proledine, it's even less active. So it suggests that the ethyl groups have to be mobile, but they have to be in a particular orientation. So once we establish that, how would we test the idea that there was some specific place in the receptor? So <clears throat> here again is LSD. And these two ethyl groups, I'm showing arrows because they can swing around. They're flexible. They can move. And what we realized is if we took the ends of those ethyl groups, so if this is an ethyl here and this is an ethyl, and if we put another carbon and hooked it together, we could make this four-membered ring called an azetidine. And now you have three possibilities for where those ethyl groups are. One is they're on the same side of that four-membered ring, or they could be on opposite sides this way or opposite sides this way. So we could have an SS and an RR depending on the stereochemistry here. So these are space filling models showing you, here's one orientation of LSD where the ethyl group is down and in the front and the other one's up in the back, or up in the front and down in the back. And these are the rigid azetidines. Again, one down in the front and one up in the back, or one up in the front, down in the back. So this just shows you the approximate similarity between these rigid locked azetidines and the possible extreme conformations of LSD. This is just a top view to show you again. Here's LSD in two different binding orientations and the azetidines in two different orientations, SS and RR. And when we tested these in drug discrimination, we found out this is the one that had the LSD-like activity. That actually became a designer drug that's for sale called LSZ. <clears throat> and in our drug discrimination assay, here is the ED50 in this particular day, 45 nanomoles for LSD, 25 for LSZ, the SS trans is that it died. The cis is 115 and the RR is 134. So clearly in the animals and the rats that were trained to recognize LSD, they saw the SS azetidine as similar to LSD. <clears throat> so we published those studies in 2002. And we predicted that LSD would bind in the orientation that was like the SS dimethyl azetidine. And we then developed a model of the receptor. This is called a homology model, and I'm not showing you the whole thing, but this is the receptor, and this is approximately where LSD would bind, and this is where the diethyl group is. And we realized that there was a residue here called leucine-229 that interacted, seemed to interact with that diethyl group. So when I talked about the receptor before, I said it went inside and outside and inside and outside. So when it comes up out of helix-4, there's a loop that goes over to the top of helix 5. It's called extracellular loop 2. And this leucine 229 is in that loop. So we hypothesized that when LSD bound, that the basis for that stereoselectivity of the receptor was related possibly to the interaction of this leucine residue, which was in extracellular loop 2. So in 2017, we published the crystal structure 
of LSD and the serotonin 5-HT2B receptor. The 2B receptor is very similar to the 2A receptor. It just turned out that it crystallized faster. We have a structure of the 2A receptor with LSD now, but it hasn't been published yet. So we published the structure, and this is sort of a space-filling picture, but this yellow part is extracellular loop 2, and here's leucine 229, and you can see it's kind of turned down. And if we could expand that, you'd see that it's actually wedged down between the LSD and another part of the receptor. And this is a little more clear. So this is the structure of the receptor. I've taken away all the superfluous stuff so you can see the backbone. And here's LSD bound within the receptor. So this is taken from the crystal structure. And the blue is the structure of the SS azetidide superimposed on it. So in 2002, we predicted the confirmation of LSD that we published in 2017, 15 years earlier. And if you, the RR azetidide, this blue piece here would be down here. This blue piece here would be up here. It would be the reverse, the mirror image. So we know how it binds to the receptor. We know its shape. It's purely academic, but I think interesting. I have no idea how much time I have because when we started, but hopefully I have a few more minutes. Um, <clears throat> so I was troubled by the fact that there was no clinical research being done on psychedelics. And I talked to many people, and they said, oh, you can never do it. Ann Shogun said, oh, you can never test these in humans. The government will never allow it. I thought you could. You just need to get private donors. So I called several colleagues up, and I said, listen, I want to start a not-for-profit to try to get money from uh, wealthy people to fund psychedelic research. And it was very controversial. We had one fellow who's a real estate uh, developer in San Diego, and he, he and his wife gave us $10,000 early on, and he said, nobody can ever know where this money came from. <laughs> So it was very difficult. We naively believed that some of the Silicon Valley people, like Steve Jobs and so forth, would just be willing to give us money because of their experience with psychedelics. We knew that in that community of the computer people and software people that a lot of them used psychedelics. But that turned out not to be the case for a long time. But we still have garnered $10 million to support research, which isn't a lot over that period of time, but allowed us to do some pioneering studies. So the study of, uh, the early study of psilocybin and obsessive compulsive disorder at University of uh, Arizona, that's actually been expanded. Now we have another study of OCD with psilocybin at Yale University that's just starting. So just to highlight some of those, Charlie Grobe did his first study that he published in 2011 uh, on uh, use of psilocybin in end-of-life cancer patients and showed that it could alleviate some of the distress in cancer patients. And then we had this larger study, uh, two of them, um, in treatment of anxiety and depression in life-threatening illness at New York University and Johns Hopkins. And Matt Johnson is here. He'll talk about s some similar work, I think. Um, then uh, psilocybin and treatment of cigarette smoking, which is Matt Johnson's study. And he has expanded that. It's an ongoing study now. Michael Bogenschutz looking at psilocybin the treatment of alcoholism, uh, N equals 10. He's now doing a larger study that's recruiting 100 participants. Um, we have uh, my son studying the effects of psychedelics on gene expression and anti-inflammatory effects. He's just published another paper this week. Uh, study of psilocybin on brain functions. That's coming out of our uh, Hefter Zurich clinic that's been run by Franz Vollenweider and is being taken over now by Katrin Preller, another neuroscientist. We have Peter Hendricks at the University of Alabama uh, looking at cocaine, uh, psil uh, psilocybin treatment with uh, cocaine addicts, hardcore cocaine addicts, and ongoing effects of, uh, on behavior, psychology, and brain function. You probably know that uh, Johns Hopkins, and I'm not hoping that a spoiler here, but Johns Hopkins just was given $17 million to set up a Center for Psychedelic Studies. So this is all really blossoming very quickly, and you're seeing uh, pretty amazing stuff with the International Society for Study of Psychedelics having 100, more than 100 participants in their inaugural meeting. So things are really taken off. So how do these work? So traditional notions of receptor-based pharmacotherapy can't explain it. So how do we explain it? 
So let's see if I can make this run. Yeah, it looks like it won't run. So what this would show you is a real-time uh, brain that's being studied using magnetoencephalography. And you would see these patterns of electrical activity just spreading in real time throughout the brain. So the brain really works by these electrical connections. And so a paper that came out of Carhart Harris's group talked about what actually happens. They use brain imaging to show that in SIBO, you don't have a lot of connectivity, but under psilocybin, you have increased connectivity. So this is not anatomically correct, but yes. Um, and any of these studies, are you finding incidents of synesthesia? They have, um, they have shown that, uh, I think it was done in Zurich, that when uh, this increased uh, connectivity occurs, that it recruits areas from the visual, the visual cortex recruits areas. So there's a basis for it. Because what, I, I'm a dancer, and sometimes on high doses of acid, I can, I can see the beat. Did you get his photograph, somebody? <laughs> you can see what? I don't mean in a, like an abstract artistic sense. I mean physically, I, I see it coming from the ground sometimes. And it's, it's one of those things that I, that I wonder if, if that synesthesia is something that we would have been able to you know, harness if we're like, you know, it was trained from being a kid or if it's something that you could only get on psychedelics. Because there, well, there are natural synesthetes. What? There are natural synesthetes. <laughs> I have, a, I have a friend who's a synesthesia. Yeah. He has synesthesia all the time. He said when he could go with his synesthesia disappears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, let me go back to this. <laughs> I'm having a synesthesia experience here. <laughs> These are not anatomically correct, but the way the brain works is you have anatomically identified areas in the brain you know, amygdala and parahippocampal gyrus and areas in the brain that normally imagine a country full of little villages. And all the people in the village all talk to each other and they go to parties together and have potluck dinners and everything, but they don't ever go outside the village. And then there's some huge event that goes on and all the people from the village go out and they'll have a great big party or a carnival or something. So, what you have are these areas that communicate locally within each other, within the areas, that are basically doing the business they're supposed to do. And when you take psilocybin or LSD, the, the internal integration of those areas breaks down and they reach out and they start communicating with all these other areas. So you have a global increase in network communication. And how does this lead to therapeutic effects? No one knows, but Robin Card Harris has used an analogy that I've used before. It's like a reset. If you have a PC and you get the blue screen of death and you hit Control Alt Delete, <laughs> that it's something like that. So if you have a part of the brain that normally is not supposed to be talking to some other part of the brain, but it does, it's called a hub failure. So that hub or that node is responding in a dysfunctional way. So in every psychiatric illness where they've done brain imaging, they've shown that there's hub failures, that network communication is dysfunctional. It's com different areas of the brain are communicating that shouldn't be talking to each other. And in the one case where I saw a study where they looked at people that were depressed and they gave them an SSRI, for the people that responded, those hub failures were restored and we went back to a, a normal behavioral pattern, normal connectivity. So basically, after this global increase occurs, there's some kind of a reset that occurs. And then when the drug wears off, the dysfunctional hub connections have been restored to a healthy pattern. And this is going to be something that psychiatry studies for the next 20 or 30 years, probably. What is it? How does this work? How does that reset things? So depression and anxiety and addictions and obsessive compulsive disorder, how are they going? So this is going to be a, a future of a lot of study in psychiatry. Yes. So how does that continue to happen? Like if once it's reset, that it will happen again? Uh, presumably not, although with the, the studies of depression, where you have a long-term, months-long uh, therapeutic effect, presumably they don't return. 
at least not very quickly. Now, my son has been looking at the anti-inflammatory effects of these, and he believes that neuroinflammation plays a part. And a lot of people now are saying neuroinflammation. So he thinks that the anti-inflammatory effects of these may also help to resolve the long-term effects. But it's not something that you apparently have to do repeatedly. So once you fix it, it stays fixed at least for months, if not years. Yes? It um, really depends on set and setting. Um, some people can take 500 micrograms of LSD and sit there and talk to you and just chat. <coughs> and other people can take 100 micrograms and be off in the universe somewhere. So it sort of depends. Everybody's an individual. It depends on their wiring, set and setting, lots of factors. So I would say there's not a threshold dose. But if, it seems like someone who has this transcendent or peak experience that can occur with different doses, and that seems to be related to the therapeutic effect. There's been a debate as to whether you need that transcendent effect for therapy, whether that causes it or something else causes it. My opinion has been that that may be a biomarker of the actual resetting process, that when you have that, that's just that's saying that you're getting this reset, this global increase occurring. But there's still a lot of research to be done. Um, just to mention what causes that, when you activate serotonin 2A receptors on cortical pyramidal cells, they generally don't cause action potentials. When we think of neurons firing, firing at action potentials. But what happens is when you activate serotonin 2A receptors on cortical pyramidal cells, it depolarizes the cell membrane, but it doesn't lead to an action potential. So they become more sensitive they increased their gain. But my son did a study where they took cells that were activated and found that there was a subset of cells in deep cortex, largely in what's called the claustrum, which actually do generate action potentials. And they express two to three times the level of serotonin 2A receptors that you see in a normal cortical pyramidal cell. And so they actually generate action potentials. And the claustrum is one of the most highly connected areas in the brain. It projects to all areas of the forebrain. Here it is in just an example of its connectivity. So what he believes is that's a, that is a uh, catalytic or uh, initiating uh, cell type so that the other cells in the cortex are, are activated, they're more sensitive, but this core group of cells, this uh, trigger population in the deeper levels of the cortex that fire action potentials are actually causing the change in uh, membrane potential. Again, this is still speculation, but <laughs> this is what we're all hoping for, right? And uh, I think we're going to get there. Just taking a little longer. But I told somebody years ago, they said, uh, what is your hope for the future? This has been 10 or 15 years ago. And I said, well, someday I hope that you're going to be having a midlife crisis and your primary care physician is going to send you down the road to a shaman slash psychiatrist, whatever they're called, and he'll recommend a, a session with you, and you'll do a session with a psychedelic, and you'll get a perspective on your life, what's going wrong, what you need to do, get a different perspective. And I said, that'll happen long after I'm dead. And she said, oh my God, that's so depressing, long after you're dead? And I said, well, you know, at least if the trajectory is going in the right direction, I'll be happy. So what we're, where we are today, I never imagined would happen in my lifetime. So with that, I'll thank the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which funded my work for 29 years, and uh, the Robert C. and Charles Anderson.